deity of Jesus Christ, then if you die 30 minutes from now, your soul, which is the most important possession you have, will leave your body and go directly to hell. If, however, you accept Jesus Christ within the next 15 minutes and allow him to come into your life and be your Lord and Savior, then you will have eternal salvation guaranteed to you. Now that choice is yours to make. And also, you will have officially become a member of the family of God. Now in the case of Frank Sinatra, he may have blown it, for there will be no second chances given unto Frank. But in your case, you have a chance, a chance to get right with God by doing it God's way instead of your own way. Now one of Frank Sinatra's signature songs and one of his biggest hits exemplifies his philosophy concerning life and the things which were important to him. And the song was My Way. And if you listen very carefully to the lyrics to the song, you will detect a spirit of pride and rebellion against anything that tries to control or tell Frank what to do. And the first stanza of the song is like a self-fulfilling prophecy regarding his own life. And it went like this. And now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. My friend, I'll say it clear, I'll state my case of which I'm certain. I've lived a life that's full. I traveled each and every highway, and more, much more than this, I did it my way. Regrets? I've had a few, and then again too few to mention. I did what I had to do, and saw it through without exemption. I planned each charted course, each careful step along the byway, and more, much more than this, I did it my way. For what is a man, what has he got? If not himself, then he has not to say, to say things he truly feels and not the words of one who kneels. The records show I took the blows and I did it my way. Those lyrics seem to reveal to us a man who is filled with the spirits of pride and selfishness and a humanistic outlook toward life. But a person harboring that kind of philosophy is an abomination in the sight of God. When you become consumed by your wants and needs to the point that you become the center of your world and the focal point of your worship, then it's only a matter of time before you feel the wrath of God descending upon you. For in the eyes of God, what he considers great is not the same as greatness in the eyes of men. And this fact is confirmed in the 23rd chapter of St. Matthew and the 11th through the 12th verse. The more lowly your service to others, the greater the greater you are. To be the greatest, be a servant. But those who think themselves great shall be disappointed and humbled. And those who humble themselves shall be exalted. Those possessing a spirit of haughtiness and pride angers God, and he will not answer their prayers. Not until that condition is rectified. But those who seek to do God's will and have a humble spirit, God will hear them and protect them and answer their prayers and will greatly exalt them. And this is explained to us in the second chapter of Philippians and the third through the 11th verse. 
Don't be selfish. Don't live to make a good impression on others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't just think about your own affairs, but be interested in others too and in what they are doing. Your attitude should be the kind that was shown us by Jesus Christ, who though he was God, did not demand and cling to his rights as God, but laid aside his mighty power and glory, taking the disguise of a slave and becoming like men. And he humbled himself even further, going so far as actually to die a criminal's death on a cross. Yet, it was because of this that God raised him up to the heights of heaven and gave him a name which is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And whether they are a king or a queen, a beggar man or a thief, or even a singer of songs. Everyone will bow their knee to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. Now, what about yourself? What is your position on this matter? Remember that God is omniscient. He knows all things. And he can see the secret desires of your heart, and he can ascertain your hidden agendas. Can you really be a servant of others and not have any reservation on your part in serving God by serving others? Now, Jesus Christ himself tried to address this question in his talks with his disciples. And in the 10th chapter of St. Mark, and the 42nd through the 45th verse, Indirectly, he's talking to us as well. It's like he's asking us, do we have our ego in check to the point that we would be willing to serve others and that in itself would have a higher priority concerning the things which are important to us than being served by others and having them cater to our wishes and desires? So Jesus called them to him and said, As you know, the kings and great men of the earth lord it over the people, but among you it is different. Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be greatest of all must be the slave of all. For even I, the Messiah, I am not here to be served, but to help others and to give my life as a ransom for many. You know, this is something to really think about. For you see, the world defines greatness in terms of power, possessions, prestige, and position. If you can demand service from others, the world says you have arrived. In our self-serving culture with its what's in it for me and me first mentality, acting like a servant is not a popular concept. But you see, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ measures greatness in terms of service and not status. God determines your greatness by how many people you serve not how many people serve you. And Jesus also wants you to know that actions speak louder than words. As he states in the seventh chapter of St. Matthew and the 16th and 21st verse, you can tell what they are by what they do. And not all who sound religious are really godly people. They may refer to me as Lord, but still they won't go to heaven. For the decisive question is whether they obey my Father in heaven. And real servants of God don't try to use God for their own purposes. They let God use them for his purposes. And one of God's greatest desires is for you to receive eternal salvation and have eternal fellowship with him and his son Jesus Christ in heaven 
throughout eternity. And it can all be yours if you simply do it God's way instead of your own way. For to God, obedience is better than sacrifice. And when you willingly accept his gift of salvation, which is his son Jesus Christ, it greatly pleases God. For it is not God's desire that anyone should be sent to hell because of their disobedience of not accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And considering the condition of the world today, many people are wondering, what's delaying the Lord's return? Well, the fact is, we are living in a period of grace. We have been given a reprieve. But it's very important that we make good use of that time and heed the warning that's given to us in 2 Peter, the third chapter, and the third through the ninth verse. First, I want to remind you that in the last days, there will come scoffers who will, do the, who will do very wrong they can think of, and they will even laugh at the truth. This will be their line of argument. So Jesus promised to come back, did he? Then where is he? He'll never come back. Why, as far as anyone can remember, everything has remained exactly as it was since the first day of creation. They deliberately forget this fact that God did destroy the world with a mighty flood long after he had made the heavens by the word of his command and had used the waters to form the earth and surround it. And God has commanded that the earth and the heavens be stored away for a great bonfire at the judgment day when all ungodly men and women will perish. But don't forget this, dear friends, that a day or a thousand years from now is like tomorrow to the Lord. He isn't really being slow about his promised return, even though it sometimes seems that way. But he is, waiting for the good, he is waiting for the good reason that he is not willing that any should perish, and he is giving more time for sinners to repent. If you are a backslider or a person who has never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, well, today is your day of salvation. For now you can receive eternal salvation and know without a shadow of a doubt that you are saved and are a part of the family of God. And all of this can become a reality in your life if you're willing to take this simple act of faith, of lifting your hands with me and repeating these words. My Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and I ask for your forgiveness as I repent of my sins. And Father, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and in his name do I pray. Amen. That was all that it took. You are now a member of the family of God, and you are saved. And I want to show you something. Right now, you can receive a miracle. Simply lift your hands with me. Heavenly Father, you are aware of the thousands of hands which are going up right now. I'm asking that you grant each one a miracle that they're praying for. And we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and in his name do we pray. Amen. God has confirmed his word by providing you with your miracle. And all that's needed on your part is for you to simply praise him, honor, and thank him. And reach out and accept your miracle. Hallelujah. I want to take this time to thank you for allowing me to come into your home today. And I want to remind you